that was the, the best joke I ever played on my brother. I visited him when he was at McCormick. He went to market on the front. I went up to his room to visit him at McCormick, and I passed four people in the hall. And each of them said, hey, man, because they thought it was So each person was just like,
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcia Drame, and I'm an assistant general counsel in the law department at Northwestern Mutual, and I am the president of the Milwaukee Bar Association Board. On behalf of the Milwaukee Bar Association staff and board, I wanted to welcome you all today. Thank you for attending this judicial forum. The Milwaukee Bar has been around since 1858. We, this will be our 158th year. And among the number of things that we do, one thing that is part of our mission is to increase public awareness of the crucial role that law plays in the lives of the people of Milwaukee County. And this forum today is one of the ways that we um, execute that part of our mission. I'd like to thank Justice Bradley and Judge Kloppenberg for being here today, thank you. And I will now turn things over to Judge John D'Amato to introduce our moderator. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Drame. I am Judge John D'Amato. I'm a Milwaukee County Circuit Court Judge. Uh, and on behalf of the Milwaukee Bar Association, I would too want to welcome you to today's second Supreme Court Judicial Forum. Uh, I've been working with the M Milwaukee Bar Association somewhat as a facilitator for these forums for many, many years. And the Milwaukee Bar Association really uh, deserves credit for putting forth forums like this. They were the first organization, the first legal organization in southeastern Wisconsin to put on forums with respect to judicial elections. And they've been doing this for over a quarter of a century. That's because they have a commitment to an informed electorate. Um, I also want to thank the uh, members of the media who are here uh, who really help contribute to an informed electorate uh, by how they report on forums such as this. Um, I also want you to know that the Wisconsin Eye uh, will be streaming this forum live and it will be in their archives and can be accessed, I believe it's on their website or on YouTube. It will be available to anyone who was unable to be here today. I also want to thank Justice Bradley and uh, Judge Kloppenberg, the two finalists who are seeking election to the seat on the Wisconsin Supreme Court for being here today. Um, their willingness to address us uh, and their willingness to answer your questions, your written questions. Um, I would like to just briefly tell you about the format. I think many of you are aware of the format, but just to make sure everyone understands. Uh, each of the candidates will be given two minutes to make an opening statement. Um, the order for presenting opening statements and the order in which they give their closing arguments uh, that was decided earlier today by a coin toss. Um, after the opening statements, the members of the audience, the members of the public and the Milwaukee Bar Association who are here will have an opportunity to submit written questions for the moderator to put to the candidates. And on the corner of each table, you'll see a, a piece of paper. Um, if you want to submit a question for consideration, write it out. Raise your hand so that a staff member will know that you have a question. Uh, and then the questions will be turned over to me, and I will get the questions up to uh, Mr. Walters, who will be the moderator. Um, I do want to make it real clear, while we have a number of members of the media here, this forum and the written questions that are being submitted are to come from the audience, the lawyers and the members of the public who are here. If any members of the media who are here have their own questions, we would ask that you uh, ask the candidates if they'll be willing to answer your questions after the forum. But this is not a forum for the media, per se. Uh, it's a forum for the public, the people. Um, in terms of submitting your question, um, you can submit hard-hitting questions, but please, those questions must be respectful. Um, and as I indicated, the questions will be given to me, and I will vet those questions, and I will give the questions to Mr. Walters. He will make the ultimate decision as to what questions are put to the candidates. Um, at the conclusion of the questioning, at about uh, 12.55, each of the candidates will be given an opportunity to make a closing statement to you. Uh, and Mr. Walters will uh, strictly enforce the, the time limits. So that's how this forum is going to work. Um, the moderator is going to be Steve Walters. He's the senior producer of the Wisconsin Eye, and he's been in that worked in that capacity since 2009. The Wisconsin Eye is a nonprofit, private public affairs cable network in Wisconsin. It provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of what goes on in the Wisconsin legislature. Um, Mr. Walters previously covered the Wisconsin Capitol for the Milwaukee Sentinel and then the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel between 1988 and 2009. Please welcome Steve Walters.
Thank you, Judge, and thank you, candidates, for being here. Thank you. I just want to repeat quickly the format. There will be two-minute opening statements. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to questions. There will be one-minute closing segments. So let's go right into it. I'd like to introduce the candidates, going first with the incumbent. Justice Rebecca Bradley was appointed to the Wisconsin Supreme Court in September of 2015. Before that, she served on the Wisconsin Court of Appeals and as a Milwaukee County Circuit Court judge. Before joining the Milwaukee County Circuit Court bench, she practiced law for 16 years. A native of Wisconsin, Justice Bradley earned her bachelor's degree from Marquette University. She earned her law degree from the University of Wisconsin Law School. Justice Bradley, thank you for being here. Judge Joanne Kloppenberg is the presiding judge on District 4 of the Court of Appeals. She was elected to that position in 2012 before joining the bench. Judge Kloppenberg was an assistant attorney general at the Wisconsin Department of Justice between 1989 and 2012, where she handled a great variety of cases. She is a graduate of the UW Law School and has taught at the UW Law School since 1990. Now, as the judge said, uh, as a result of a coin toss, uh, Justice Bradley, going first, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the Milwaukee Bar Association for again hosting a forum for this race, and I would like to thank Mr. Walters for moderating it, and I'd like to thank Judge Kloppenberg for participating. Thank you to all of you who have attended and are taking an interest in this very important election. I am the best candidate to continue serving the people of Wisconsin on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. I bring 20 years of experience in the legal and judicial professions. Before I became a judge, I practiced law for over 16 years as a civil litigator, a business transactional attorney, and an arbitrator. I also served as vice president of legal operations for an international software company. I bring a vast diversity of experience to the Supreme Court bench based on my practice as an attorney. I decided to become a judge because I care so deeply about the state of Wisconsin, and I really felt called to serve the people of Wisconsin as a member of the judiciary. I was honored when the people of Milwaukee County elected me to serve as a Milwaukee County Circuit Court judge. I served in children's court where I dedicated myself to strengthening families, protecting children in need, and keeping my community safe. I then served on the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, where I heard appeals from the trial courts of Milwaukee County in all areas of the law. And now I am honored to serve the people as a member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. I am the first Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice to bring experience from both the trial court bench and the Court of Appeals bench. I think we're going to get into this issue in more depth during the course of the forum, but the real reason that drives me to serve the people of Wisconsin as a member of the judiciary is my judicial philosophy of saying what the law is and not what I may wish it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Kloppenberg, please. Thank you so much. It's good to be back. And thank you for paying attention to this very important race. It is about the future of our Supreme Court. It's about what kind of court it ought to be and what kind of justices we should be electing to the court. I've been to all 72 counties, and people, I'm, I'm struck by their shared hopes for what the court ought to be. It ought to be a place where everybody feels like they've had a fair shake, where every justice approaches every case with an open mind, where the outcome of any case is not a foregone conclusion. In short, it should be a place where we can all be confident that justice is being done without fear or favor. And that's why I'm running, because I'm unwilling to surrender our court to the special interests and partisan politics that threaten to undermine the independence and integrity of our court. And that's what distinguishes me from my opponent, independence, integrity, and experience. I have a proven track record of being a fair, independent, thoughtful, and principled appellate court judge. I have a nonpartisan background. I have served all of the people of Wisconsin and stood up for the interests of all of the people of Wisconsin my entire career. I believe that once you have heard our answers to your questions, you too will conclude that I am the only candidate that the voters of Wisconsin can count on to bring independence and integrity to our court. Thank you. Thank you. 
We will take turns, uh, the, the candidates will take turns answering the question. The first question is this, going to Justice Bradley. People perceive and express a belief that the court is political and its decisions reflect politics, not the law. What will you say and do in the public domain to address these concerns? Please be specific. Your Honor. Thank you. I will continue to be the jurist that I have been on every level of the court system in the state of Wisconsin. Anyone who has appeared in front of me, either as an attorney or as a party, has seen that I am a fair and impartial jurist. My judicial philosophy ensures that I will always follow the law. I will always apply the law as it is written by our elected representatives in the legislature and as it is written in our state and federal constitutions. I will always follow the law regardless of how I might personally feel about either the outcome in the case or about the law itself. And I have a proven track record of doing just that at every level of the court system. Response, Judge Kloppenberg, please. We can address and eliminate the perception that partisan politics is influencing our court by electing a nonpartisan justice to the court. I have a nonpartisan record, have elected attorney general under attorney general from both political parties, being elected to the Court of Appeals, having issued hundreds of appellate decisions that show that I am an independent, impartial, fair, and principled judge who applies the law to the facts and adheres to the record before the court and to the law that guides the issues that are presented by the parties. My opponent, in contrast, has been appointed three times to three judgeships in three years by Governor Walker and brings her very partisan background with her onto the court. And it is her partisan background, including her rep being a member of the Republican National Lawyers Association when she was a lawyer, being an active member of the Federalist Society, the Republican Party is contributing to her campaign's staffing and operations, and her first decisions on the court were to side with Justices Gableman, Prosser, Ziegler, and Rogensack to quash efforts to review the judicial code of conduct, including the recusal rules, and to make the operations of the court more transparent. Did you wish a short rebut, yes. Justice? It's interesting that Judge Kloppenberg has repeatedly, since the beginning of this campaign, emphasized the fact that I have been appointed by Governor Walker. Of course, that is true. Governor Walker has done his constitutional duty to appoint judges and justices when there are vacancies, either created by resignations or, in this case, by the sad passing of Justice Patrick Crooks. What Judge Kloppenberg has not told you is that she has three times applied for judicial appointments first to Governor Doyle, and then also to President Obama. There's nothing wrong with a jurist being appointed by the governor under our constitutional system. With respect to the so-called efforts to quash a review of the Judicial Code of Conduct, it is simply not true. A rules petition was presented to the court. It was not in the proper full amend a rule or create a new rule. It asked us to create a conduct. It is not appropriate to do that through a rules petition. The Supreme Court can address changes to the Code of Judicial Conduct and create, can create a committee without the need for any rules petition. The only candidate in this race who has introduced politics into it is Judge Kloppenberg. I could respond please? Shortly, please. Right. Yeah. I did apply to both governors, Governor Thompson and Governor Doyle, to be on the Court of Appeals, and I didn't have the political connections to get me there. What is unusual about the series of appointments that have gotten Rebecca Bradley to the court is a fast-track series of appointments to the Circuit Court, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court. In just three years, that fast-track series of appointments suggests that it was politics, not qualifications, that got her on the court. Moving on to question two. In recent, it'll go to Judge Kloppenberg. In recent elections, huge amounts of money have been spent by special interest groups who oftentimes have an agenda they want the court to adopt in its decisions to advance the candidacy of Supreme Court candidates. Should a candidate distance herself from those special interest groups, please be specific. Judge Kloppenberg first, please. I have been consistent from when I ran in 2011 that 
the massive expenditures by unregulated special interests that don't have to disclose their donors raises the, the concern among the people of the state that justice is for sale. But under our, under our Supreme Court rulings, state and federal, they have a right to participate in these elections. I cannot control them. I do not control them. I am focusing on portraying an accurate picture based on the facts of what distinguishes me from my opponent. And I have urged the people of Wisconsin to reject special interest ads that are based on innuendo, that distort my record, that resort to labels when they don't have the facts or want to hide the facts. Justice Bradley, your response, ma'am. Five years ago, when Judge Kloppenberg made her first bid for Supreme Court, there was an ad that was run on her behalf against Justice Prosser by the Greater Wisconsin Committee. $1.6 million was spent on this ad, and I think it was one of the most vile political attack ads in state history. I watched a forum where Judge Prosser, Justice Prosser held a letter from the subject of that ad, a now adult man who had been subjected to uh, sexual assault by a priest. And the ad was so misleading that this poor man came forward to defend Justice Prosser and to ask that the ad be taken down. And Justice Prosser asked Judge Kloppenberg to disavow this sleazy ad, and she did not have the integrity to do so. But now, in this race, she is decrying the involvement of third parties in advertising. Did you want a short rebut, Judge Clappenberg? I'll move, move to question three. It's not necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, question three for Justice Bradley. People believe that there is a tension on the court that hinders its ability to do its work. What will you do going forward to reduce tension on the court so as to improve the reputation of the court in the eyes of the citizens of Wisconsin? Please be specific. Justice Bradley, please. One of the very positive contributions that I have five months, and I want everyone to know that each and every one of my colleagues on that court welcomed me warmly and helped ease my transition from the Court of Appeals. I think every member of the court is well aware that the court's reputation has diminished a little bit over the last few years because of some well-publicized incidents that have occurred with respect to some of the justices on the court. Everyone on the court is working very hard to work well and collegially with each other so that we can continue to serve the public in the best way possible. And I am contributing very positively to that collegial uh, collegiality on the court with my personal and judicial temperament. Thank you. Judge Klappenberg, please. I take the justices at their word that they want to improve their collegiality. And if I am fortunate enough to join them, I will bring my record of getting along well professionally with people and getting their respect. I supervised attorneys at the Department of Justice, focused on the positive that they had to offer and got the best work out of them. Similarly, as I am honored to have been chosen to be the presiding judge in my district, I respect my colleagues even though I don't always agree with them. On the Supreme Court, the, the, the focus though is not on being gracious to each other, it's about getting talking with each other on substantive issues and on the work of the court. Are the decisions that come out well reasoned, do they adhere to the record and the law? And we have some evidence that they're not talking very well with each other on substantive issues. I cite a recent decision, Alvarez, where there were conflicting mandates among the, the, the two leading opinions for what the circuit court should be doing. And if they had talked with each other substantively, that conflict would not have existed. Question four for, um, let's see where am I, Justice, uh, Judge Kloppenberg, excuse me. Okay. Um, 757. Point nine, parent five, requires a judge who is disqualified on a case to file in writing the reasons. While this rule clearly applies to circuit court judges, it may not apply to Supreme Court justices. However, for transparency reasons, should a Supreme Court justice who decides not to participate in a case give the reason for that decision? Judge Klappenberg, please. Generally, a Supreme Court justice should give a reason for recusal, but there are times where doing so 
would breach confidentialities or compromise the fair adjudication of the case. And in, that, in those situations, then the justice is better off not um, presenting the reason for recusal. Justice Bradley? I agree with Judge Kloppenberg on this issue. There are certain circumstances where I think it's really clear to the public why a justice recuses himself or herself. For example, in my own circumstances, I am statutorily and ethically, and I think under plain common sense, prohibited from sitting as a Supreme Court justice and hearing any case that I was involved in as a court of appeals judge or as a trial court judge. But as Judge Kloppenberg alluded to, there are situations where a judge or justice coming from private practice, for example, may have had a client, uh, attorney-client relationship with a party to a case uh, before the Supreme Court where that justice could not sit on that case uh, because of that prior relationship, but to disclose the reason might uh, force the justice to disclose an attorney-client privilege matter. Thank you. Next question for Justice Bradley. Justice Bradley, in statements on Monday and Tuesday, you said comments on gays, AIDS, and denouncing the election of President Clinton you made as a Marquette University student 24 years ago are not, and quoting you, are not reflective of my worldview. What examples can you offer of your changed worldview, please? First of all, I have been spending the last couple of days speaking to the media primarily, but also to certain people individually to express how sorry I am for the sentiments that I expressed a quarter century ago as a young college student. I am, as I have said, extremely embarrassed and frankly mortified by those statements. I am very sorry to all of the people who had to read them a quarter century ago, and I'm very sorry to all of the people who have had to read them this week. I have grown as a person, as I think many people can appreciate, we are not the same person that we were when we were a 20-year-old kid in college or a quarter of a century ago. And what has changed for me, and I think this will be familiar to many people who have gone through similar changes in their life, as you grow as a person, as you interact with people who come from different backgrounds and different experiences, as you listen to people who have experienced terrible prejudice and unfairness in their lives, when you learn and grow as a person through your life experiences and through interacting with different people, you realize how wrong you might have been when you thought you knew everything at the age of 20. I, like many other people, have gone through that growth process. And it started when I started to see the reaction to some of the things that I wrote when I was 20 years old. That started me thinking about, wow, words can be really powerful and have a terrible effect on somebody and really hurt somebody and I, starting back then, didn't want to be that person. And I am not the person that I was 24 years ago. And there are some specific examples that I've been citing when I've been asked. I go back to the last few years when I served in children's court in Milwaukee County. And I had to counsel and comfort children who were thrown out of their homes because they were gay and rejected by their own parents. And I presided happily over adoptions by gay couples who were bringing into their homes children who came from horrible circumstances. I've been asked if I would preside over a gay wedding. Of course I would if a friend or a family member asked me to preside over their marriage. Of course I would. My changes come from a mosaic of life experiences, from holding children and babies infected with AIDS in Malawi, Africa. That's all I have to say. Thank Judge Plattenberg, your response, please. Yes, Justice Bradley talks about change and talks about this being, you know, now is now, then was then. But her career does not show much evidence of change. As I noted before, she has continued to articulate very extreme and conservative viewpoints throughout her career and, and be part of groups that espouse those kinds of viewpoints from her membership in groups like the Federalist Society and the Republican National Lawyers Association, to an article she wrote just a few years before she was first appointed by Governor Walker that appeared to equate contraception with murder, to the support and assistance she's gotten from very extreme conservative groups in this campaign. And I, in contrast, 
have stood up for all of the people of Wisconsin my entire career, and even before I went to law schools. I stood up for what I believed was right for my community, serving in the Peace Corps, starting the federal nutrition program for women, infants, and children in two poor rural counties, and being very active in my community as I still am. And I have performed many, many marriages for gay and lesbian folks, and they weren't friends or family when they asked me to, but they became so after I performed their ceremonies. Do you choose to respond, Justice Bradley? Yes, I would. The only thing I can conclude from Judge Kloppenberg being so assured that I'm going to introduce my politics and my policy preferences into my judicial decision making, which I have zero record of doing because I never have, but I think she protests so much along those lines because that is exactly her judicial philosophy. Judge Kloppenberg has been very careful about her words, but she espouses a judicial philosophy that believes that it is appropriate for a judge to introduce his or her policy preferences and politics into judicial decision making. She has explained this by saying she thinks it's our job as judges to promote a more equal society. That's a very nice sentiment, but I'm not sure what that means because somebody's idea, one judge's idea, of what is promoting an equal society can vary greatly from the next judge's idea of what it means to promote an equal society. Judge Kloppenberg has also espoused that she believes through the justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, whose judicial philosophy she is most aligned with, she believes that our Constitution is a living document, the meaning of which should change to reflect changing social and political conditions. That allows a judge, under that philosophy, to introduce her personal policy preferences and politics into her judicial decision making. And as I'm talking to people all over the state of Wisconsin, that is exactly what they do not want in a justice, regardless of what their political preferences judge are. Judge Kloppenberg, uh, short response, and then I want to move on to another subject. Please, ma'am. Well, I think we need to spend a little more time on judicial philosophy. What Justice Bradley says about my philosophy is nonsense. It is what she would like people to believe, but what is not true, and that's not a good trait in a judge. I have a proven track record for three and a half years issuing decisions as an appellate court judge that shows I'm an independent, fair, thoughtful, and, prison and principled appellate court decision maker. Of course, I apply the law as it's written, and I approach every case with an open mind and apply that law to the facts in the case fairly and thoughtfully in a principled and disciplined manner to answer the questions that are presented by the parties. I respect the role of the court as an independent check and balance on the other branches of government, and I have a duty to uphold the Constitution, which represents the will of the people and contains the fundamental principles that define our democracy, that protect our individual rights, and that promote a more equal society. In contrast, my opponent espouses a judicial philosophy that follows almost verbatim the words on the Federal Society website. I, I am guided by the Constitution, the law, and precedent, not by slogans. And my judicial track record is evidence of that. Next question for Judge Kloppenberg, followed by Justice Bradley. Judge Kloppenberg, what is the context of the quote, the soundbite being used by your opponents? I, I believe it's from your, the 2011 campaign. Quote, tough on crime is not my message. I, I want to give you a chance to put that in context, Judge. Well, that, that is a clause taken out of context from five years ago by WMC, and I don't think I need to say any more about that. I am endorsed by the largest law enforcement association in the state, by sheriffs and DAs, and many, many, many judges around the state, and many community leaders and regular voters who know that I will be fair and independent and impartial, and who, and I have again a proven track record. No one can point to any of my decisions and say that was written by a, a, a conservative judge, that was written by a liberal judge, that was written by a soft on crime judge, that was written by a tough on crime judge. Rather, I have shown myself to be a judge who follows the law and applies it to the facts of the case in a fair, 
thoughtful and principled manner. Justice Bradley responds. The comments that were made by Judge Kloppenberg five years ago are not that many years ago, particularly when we're talking about comments that people make a few years back. Uh, Judge Kloppenberg very clearly said, I never said tough on crime was my message. Tough on crime is not my message. Um, I think that spoke loud and clear to the people of Wisconsin. I think it spoke loud and clear to law enforcement in the state of Wisconsin. I have a majority of the sheriffs in the state of Wisconsin backing me. Law enforcement in Milwaukee County, who knows my work in the court system best, has endorsed me across the board, including the Milwaukee Police Association, the Milwaukee Police Supervisors Organization, Sheriff David Clark, And I think it's uh, disingenuous for Judge Kloppenberg to try to distance herself from those comments. If I could respond, the real issues, as I've been going around the state for people, is to have a court that is independent, free of partisan politics, free of special interests, and not dominated by Scott Walker. The court handles civil and criminal cases. About a third of their caseload is criminal. The caseload for the Court of Appeals is much higher for criminal cases. And I, again, point to my record as a fair, independent, impartial judge who applies to law to the facts in every case and who has, in my decisions, recognized the challenges that law enforcement face as they make split-second decisions to protect our communities. And I have talked with them, and they want to make sure that we have decisions that are clear from the court, and that is my goal, to write decisions that are clear so that law enforcement knows what the law is and doesn't have to be thinking, oh my gosh, can I do this, can't I do this, when they are making their split, section, split second life and death decisions out, um, out on the streets of our, of our state. Justice Bradley, the, it's, it's your turn for the next question. It comes from a member of the audience. Is it appropriate to leave oral arguments before, this was, before the Supreme Court to attend a political event rather than hearing all parties, attorneys, and other justices and arriving late at political events outside the duties of a Supreme Court justice? As I mentioned, I've served on the Wisconsin Supreme Court for the last five months. I have participated in many oral arguments. I have seen justices arrive late, come and go during oral arguments, and leave early. The question is referencing a one occasion when I left oral arguments early. I, like my colleagues, try to avoid this if at all possible. But there are occasions when there are scheduling conflicts. We are very grateful to have Wisconsinite covering this forum today. Not only that, but they also cover and record every oral argument. So I made sure before I left a few minutes early that all of my questions were answered and I later watched the rest of the oral argument on videotape, so I missed absolutely nothing. Judge Kloppenberg, your response? Yes, there's nothing routine about leaving oral argument, in this case 23 minutes early, for a non-emergency non reason. It's a dereliction of the duty of the justices. It's their job to hear the parties argue before them. To leave before the lawyers are through presenting their arguments before the parties who, will be, who are affected by the decision the justices will reach are heard is an affront to those lawyers and to those parties. And what are they to think? What are they, how are they going to think that they've gotten a fair shake when justices leave before their arguments are done? The, um, the other part of this is that this justice left to make a campaign presentation at Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, which is a big special interest money, special interest group, big money special interest group that has supported Justice Bradley in the past and has said they will support her in the future. To have a justice leave in the middle of oral argument to go to give a campaign speech is, um, is not an appropriate is not appropriate service to be provided by the justice who is there to listen to the party's arguments and adjudicate their disputes. Next question for Judge Klappenberg. 
A new ad from a group trying to defeat you, Judge, criticizes a court of appeals ruling you and two others issued allowing a man convicted of child sex assault to get a hearing to try to withdraw his guilty plea. What is your response to that ad? Well, the ad is deceitful and distorts my record. The facts are, as you have said, that it was a per curiam decision by three judges on the Court of Appeals, Judges Lunston, Higginbotham, and, and I, where the issue was the defendant had been had pled, pleaded guilty to sexual intercourse with a 15-year-old. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison and five years extended supervision. While he was serving his sentence in prison, he moved to withdraw his plea. We follow the law within the judicial mainstream of the law that governs plea withdrawals and determined he was entitled to an evidentiary hearing on his motion to withdraw his plea. The circuit court held that hearing, denied his motion, and he remained in prison to serve out the remainder of his, of his sentence. In short, this ad is, is talking about the Court of Appeals doing its job, the circuit court doing its job, and a defendant who was convicted and sentenced serving his sentence. The system worked. Judge Brad Justice Bradley, please. I can make only a limited comment about the ad. I have seen the ad, but it appears to relate to a case that is still alive in the judicial system and one that could work its way through the appellate process, so I'm not able to comment on the substance of the case. Thank you. Next question from a member of the audience uh, for Justice Browning. Wisconsin has a massive unjust incarceration problem right now. As people are returning to our community with records that hinder employment, housing, and higher ed, Education, excuse me, do you support expungement of nonviolent records to ensure fair and equal opportunities for all people? Justice Bradley, please. The issue of expungement is exactly the type of policy determination that needs to be made by the people through their elected representatives in the legislature. Now, under the current law, there is, under particular circumstances, discretion that the trial court judges must exercise in determining whether and when expungement may be appropriate. Those are decisions I was called upon to make as a trial court judge. And it's a concern that I've been hearing uh, from voters and people who have family members, for example, who have uh, committed crimes and they're frankly hamstrung uh, in the uh, employment process trying to find a job. So I think it's certainly a policy issue that the legislature uh, must determine, but there are circumstances where expungement is certainly very appropriate. Judge Clark, please. Yes, I've been hearing from circuit court judges that they would like more discretion as to being able to expunge convictions, and I believe that the Supreme Court can play a role in working, in representing the wishes of the court system as a whole to the legislature, which does have the final word on this issue. But this issue, the question brings up other issues as well, which is the resources available to those who are unrepresented at the start of the criminal justice system. And they get appointed attorneys after they've been charged, but they are on their own often until they've been charged. And if we can figure out a way to provide legal assistance at the very start of their entry into the criminal justice system, maybe we will, the result will be, hopefully, um, more fair and equal treatment between those who can't afford their own attorneys and those who can. Next question, also from a member of the audience, Judge Kloppenberg, please. Do you believe that mandatory arbitration contracts, as re required by some employers, as a condition of employment, should bar a potential litigant from filing a lawsuit or a complaint with agencies such as the Equal Rights Division? Judge Kloppenberg. Well, that question raises legal issues that in different forms have come before me in the Court of Appeals, I'm sure will come before the Supreme Court, and so I'm not free to opine on the legality of or the propriety of arbitration agreements. Justice Bradley. I know how frustrating it is, as I've been talking to people all over the state, that we can't share our positions on issues, whether they're legal or otherwise, we're ethically prohibited from doing so because it's inconsistent with our obligation to be impartial jurists. So I think for the second time during the forum, I will simply say I agree with Judge Kloppenberg. Thank you. Uh, next question to Justice Bradley. Please identify one or two decisions you've written that you believe 
showcase your, your, your judicial philosophy and why you believe that. If you can't identify an opinion you've written, please name some decisions written by others that you believe reflect your judicial philosophy and why you believe that. Judge, Judge Spratt. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with my work on the children's court bench. Uh, many of the cases, if not most of them, uh, are cases that are confidential, and so I can't speak about specifics. But I was called upon to make decisions that were, in cases like termination of parental rights, very emotional decisions. I had to decide whether parents, at the first instance, could even continue to see or talk to their own children, and then I had to make an ultimate decision after many hearings as to whether or not it was in the best interest of a child to have parental rights terminated. I've been using this as an example because I think it best exemplifies my ability and my commitment to setting aside my personal feelings about a case. As a human being, getting to know parents and children who were appearing in front of me, I would of course develop my own feelings about where I might like to see a case go, what outcome I might like to see happen in order to make sure that I would not let my personal feelings interfere with my judicial decision making, I would always look at the text of the law, in this case the statutes, and apply the law to the facts. And that way I ensured that my personal feelings would never enter into my judicial decision making. And there were times, particularly in those types of cases, where I didn't like the outcome, but I had to follow the law because that's our job. When I was on the Court of Appeals, I rendered many decisions during the months that I was there, and each and every one of my published and unpublished opinions that are available exemplify my judicial philosophy of always following the law. And that is the one commitment I am making to the voters in the state of Wisconsin in this race. Thank you. Judge Klockenberg, please. I'll mention two cases that I have authored and have been published and were not reviewed by the Supreme Court. The first actually is an arbitration case. And in it, it's Riley and a uh, widow was suing a nursing home where her husband had died for um, negligence. And she had signed an arbitration agreement when he was admitted. And the nursing home wanted to enforce the arbitration agreement. The circuit court invalidated the arbitration agreement. And we affirmed the circuit court invalidating the arbitration agreement because it required arbitration with an arbitrator that had signed a consent decree with the Minnesota Attorney General's office never to participate in consumer arbitrations like this one because they had been found to have colluded with nursing homes in the past. And they argued that even that they would not be an arbitrator, but they could still use the rules. And we reviewed the Wisconsin law that governed how we looked at this issue and then it, the, how states around the country had addressed this issue because it was an, a first impression um, matter here in Wisconsin. And we sided with the circuit court in holding that when the rules required this arbitrator that could not participate in arbitration anymore, that arbitration agreement could not be enforced. A second case was State v. Crute, and this involved um, uh, issuing citations to groups that were gathering in the Capitol for about three weeks, for three, over a three month period in 2013. About 350 citations were issued. The rules requiring permits for gatherings in the Capitol changed over time. For those three months, it just required a permit for anyone who was gathering in the Capitol, even for a group as, as small as one. The state agreed with the defendants in that case that a rule that, like that, that doesn't have a floor, doesn't have a minimum for a permit for use of public space is unconstitutional. Because as you can imagine, that floor will change for an outside space versus the capital when you're balancing competing uses and safety matters, that floor will change. The state asked us in the Court of Appeals to hold the rules, the permitting rule constitutional by inserting a floor into that rule. And we explained that the state provided no authority that authorized us to legislate from the bench in that way and put the missing language into the rule. We declined to do that, invalidated the rule as unconstitutional, and the state did not even petition for review to the Supreme Court in that case. Thank you. The next question comes from a member of the audience which is trying to get at your judicial philosophies by asking about U.S. Supreme Court cases. So. Was the U.S. Supreme Court decision in D.C. versus Heller, that's a Second Amendment case, 
An example of the court interpreting the law, quote, as they wanted it to be rather than it was written, close quote, was Brown versus Board of Education. What about Citizens United? Justice Bradley, it's your turn first. I think it's my turn. I think it's, I think it's my turn. Yeah, I think it's my turn. I'm happy to have you. Excuse me. <laughs> no. Sorry. All of those cases, as any other case you can mention, are the law of the land, and I follow the law of the land. I would go on to say, though, sometimes reporters have asked, what are the best, what are the worst cases? And certainly, it was an exhilarating week in June last year when the US Supreme Court issued decisions on gay marriage, access to health care, and fair housing. I do believe that, oh, just looking at the last couple terms of the US Supreme Court, that the two voting rights cases in which they really took the guts out of the voting rights law and allowed just what had been shown in a trial to be very discriminatory practices to that inhibited voting were bad cases by the US Supreme Court. Justice Bradley, your response? Consistent with our ethics code, I have not, and I do not, and I think Judge Kloppenberg uh, joins me in this, talk about cases that have been decided by the Wisconsin Supreme Court or the United States Supreme Court, because even in cases where it appears that there is settled law that is created, the issues that surround that case or the issues that emanate from a particular case can come back before the higher court or before the state Supreme Court. And so in each and every instance, when I'm asked about a case, I talk about how I would approach the case and an issue that comes before me. I always start with the law. A lot of these cases that have been mentioned relate to constitutional law. Uh, with respect to Brown versus Board of Education, um, absolutely the Constitution was applied correctly in that case. I don't know that we needed to look or any court would need to look beyond the text of the Constitution of the correctly. Correct, so Justice Bradley, I think this, it's your turn to go first. When an, when an ethical complaint is filed against a judge, the Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter and makes a decision. When a member of the Supreme Court is a subject of a complaint and the other members of the court re, recuse themselves such the decision cannot be made, do you believe there should be a forum in which the complaint could be resolved? For example, a panel of Court of Appeals judges? Please be specific. Justice Bradley? This is exactly the type of issue that the Wisconsin Supreme Court has to deal with through, I think, our rules petition process. And before I would come to any conclusion about changes that might need to be made with respect to this or any other issue, I would want to hear from anyone who wants to share their perspectives, any stakeholders in our court system, any member of the public who wants to weigh in. And that is the procedure that we have set up at the Supreme Court so that somebody who wants to propose this type of a change can do so in the form of a rules petition. It's presented to the court. And with respect to many rules petitions, we receive binders of written materials from various people who do want to weigh in. We conduct public hearings. So before I would suggest or give my opinions about what I think changes sh should be made with respect to uh, how to deal with those uh, very difficult situations. I want to hear from everybody who wants to weigh in on that issue and then I will make a fully formed decision after public hearings. Judge Klopfenberg, please. Right. Here's the third, situ third circumstance in which we agree that there needs to be a rulemaking process to address what everybody feels is a big gap in, in our code that allows justices who are the subject of ethical complaints to avoid the consideration of those complaints. And I would go further, not only to look at that issue, but also recusal in general. We have one of the weakest recusal rules in the country. It's very, our rules are very subjective. I would, con I believe that we should be considering objective rules of recusal so that the test is whether it appears to a reasonable person that a judge or justice can, is, has a conflict of interest or can't be impartial. And I would review the rule that was adopted almost verbatim by the court by, from the WMC in 2011 that provides that no matter how much money a party gives to a judge or justice, that alone is not reason for recusal. And then a, a follow-up on that issue, Judge Klappenberg, to you first. Should the, uh, should the administrative conferences stay open? To, uh, should they be closed or 
still uh, open? Judge? Transparency is best for our dem democratic process in all of the branches. Of course, the judicial deliberations over cases cannot be open, but certainly the administrative conferences can be. And I think um, people, and well, I know from my going around the state that people want more transparency, not less. Justice Bradley, please. It depends on the subject matter being discussed. Um, we have, as Wisconsin Supreme Court justices, administrative and supervisory authority over the entire court system. There are many issues that come before the Supreme Court outside of our case deciding function. We have public hearings for many of the issues presented to us, and some of the conversations that we have about particular issues occur behind closed doors. Certainly, I think everyone can understand if we are dealing with a sensitive personnel issue, for example, that is something that needs to happen behind closed doors. Conversations need to be had in private. But where it is appropriate, there is absolute transparency at the Wisconsin Supreme Court. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, you've been asked this before, but I always find the answer interesting. Who on the U.S. Supreme Court, whose writings and decisions do you feel closest to? It's, I think it's your turn, Justice Bradley. This is one of the most frequent questions that we receive on the campaign trail. I have consistently cited the late Justice Antonin Scalia, along with Justices Alito and Thomas. And the reason I cite those justices as being the justices I am most philosophically aligned with is because they espouse the judicial philosophy that I hold. It is the job of justices to say what the law is and not what we may wish it to be. It is the job of justices to set aside personal policy preferences and political inclinations and to apply the law as it is written by the people's elected representatives in the legislature and as it is written in our state and federal constitutions. It is our job and I am very committed to following the rule of law, to respecting the separation of powers and to always applying the law fairly, impartially and independently. Please. And it's true, we could each give each other's answers in response to this question. I cite as the U.S. Supreme Court justices whom I respect and admire, Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg, in part because they are trailblazers for women who want to follow their footsteps in the law and on the bench, and because they do appear to share my view of the Constitution as protecting individual rights and promoting a more equal society. I also cite Justice Kennedy, for his ability to form coalitions on the court, which is a very important quality for our justices to have. Thank you. Um, I think our next question would take us over on time. So let's go to closing uh, statements. Uh, Justice Bradley, please. I want to thank everyone again for participating in this forum and for sharing your thoughtful questions with us. As I said at the outset, I am the most qualified person to continue serving the people of Wisconsin on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. This case is all about two differences in judicial philosophies. There are stark differences, as you've heard today, between the judicial philosophy that I hold and the judicial philosophy that Judge Kloppenberg holds. This is what is at stake for the people of Wisconsin. If the people of Wisconsin want to govern themselves through their elected representatives in the legislature, they will elect me. If people instead want to be dictated to and be ruled by a majority of justices who happen to sit on the Wisconsin Supreme Court, they will elect Judge Kloppenberg. This case is, this, this race is all about judicial philosophy and the experience and the credentials that the candidates would bring to the court. I am the first Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice to bring valuable experience on the trial court bench and on the Court of Appeals. And I have been elected by the people of Milwaukee County to serve as a trial court judge. I was elected because people know that I am a fair and impartial and compassionate jurist who does exactly what I have always committed to doing, which is always following the law, regardless of how I personally might feel about that particular law or about the outcome in the case. I came to the judiciary as a committed public servant because I care so deeply about the state that I was born and raised in. And it really is my honor and my privilege to serve all of you, the people of Wisconsin. Thank you.
Thank you, Justice. Judge Kloppenberg, please. We have a tremendous opportunity in this election to choose a new justice for our Supreme Court. Both candidates are telling you that they will be independent and impartial on the court. The challenge for voters is to determine who will deliver on that promise. And you can tell who will deliver on that promise by how we got where we are. I, as you know, served for 23 years as an Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice, representing the interests of the people of Wisconsin in circuit courts around the state and arguing many times in the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. And in the 23 years at the Department of Justice, no justice ever left in the midst of those oral arguments. And then I was elected to the Court of Appeals in 2012 and have a proven track record as a fair, independent, thoughtful and disciplined and principled appellate court judge. My opponent was appointed three times in three years to three judgeships by Governor Walker and brings a very partisan background with her onto the court. I have a proven track record. I have a nonpartisan background. I have superior judicial and legal qualifications and experience. And I have spent my career consistently standing up for all of the people of Wisconsin. I ask that you all, I ask you all for your vote and your support and that you will stand with me for independence and integrity on the court, for a justice who is qualified to serve on the court, for a court that serves its, as it should as an independent check and balance on the other branches of government. Thank you so much. Thank you. Prior to judge comments, I just want to thank you. Thank the candidates, thank the audience. It's been a privilege to be a moderator on behalf of Wisconsin. I, Your Honor. Thank you, Steve. Before we adjourn today's proceedings, I do have some thank yous and some reminders. First of all, I too want to thank the, the uh, candidates, Justice Bradley and Judge Kloppenberg, for being here today, uh, for addressing us, and for answering your questions. I also want to thank uh, members of the audience for being here, for submitting your questions. I thank the media for being here because there's many, many people who couldn't be here today, and hopefully uh, your presence here today and your reporting here today uh, will give some insight into the voters regarding these candidates. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Katie Borowski, who's the interim director of the Milwaukee Bar Association and the director of projects, and her entire staff for the, the hours and hours of work they put on, or put into putting this event on. Uh, and then finally, I want to st thank Steve Walters. This is the second time he has, this year, uh, conducted and moderated this forum, and he does a fantastic job, and we can't thank you enough, Steve. <laughs> now, in terms of reminders, first of all, I want to remind all of you that this was not the last judicial forum the Milwaukee Bar Association is doing this year. We have one next week. It is the Circuit Court Judicial Forum. It will be next Tuesday, March 15th, from noon until 1 o'clock. And the focus will be on two of the contested elections uh, that we have. Uh, Branch 31 is a contested election. It features Judge Paul Raffel and Attorney Hannah Dugan. If they're here, you can stand up. Thank you. And it also features a contested election in Branch 45. Uh, that's Judge Michelle Havas and Attorney Jean Keis. If they're here, they may stand up. There are also a number of other candidates who are on the ballot who are running unopposed. I'm not going to run through that long list of, uh, of uh, judges. Um, I also want to remind the members of the Milwaukee Bar Association that you should have received your judicial poll via email. Uh, I'd ask that each and every one of you take note of it, fill it out, and please submit it by the deadline. This is your opportunity to uh, rate the candidates. Um, and then the results will be released, I think it's a week or two before the election itself. Uh, finally, I want to remind all of you that the spring election is Tuesday, April 5th. I remind you to vote. I remind you to remind your family members and your friends and your neighbors to vote. Remember, voting is not just a right. It's a duty that everyone owes to their community if you really care about the courts and if you really care about your government. So I want to thank you all for being here today. Have a pleasant day. Thank you.